Good morning and welcome back to Morning Express. We're glad you're watching. Remember to grab yourself a copy of the Nairobi and today. Quite a number of stories that we did not get to have a look at this morning, but your copy is hot and ready for you. So grab it as you head out this morning. Also, remember if you don't manage to get a copy of the Standard newspaper, you can always read it online at www.standardmedia.co.ke. It is time for Friday chat. And as I've been telling you all uh, along this morning, we have Winnie Odinga as our guest. Michael Gitonga, my co-host, had a sit down with her and he began by asking her about her younger days growing up in the household of former Prime Minister Raila Odinga. How was that like? This is what she had to say. Well, I grew up here in Nairobi. I was born in Nairobi. I went to Rusinga School and afterward Brookhouse School and thereafter, I went to do my um, university studies in America. Uh, currently, I'm working here at Green Outreach Foundation, which is a renewable energy foundation um, that focuses on developing renewable energy sources in the country. Uh, aside from that, I'm a photographer. I'm a writer. i also a proponent of youth activities and getting the youth more involved um, in constructing their own reality. And uh, pretty much those, <laughs> those are things that I do. Tell me a little bit about your childhood. Do you remember, you know, when you grew up, um, did you have friends who you were playing with around? And, you know, what was your life like as uh, you were growing up? Growing up, you know, I'm much younger than my siblings. So when I was growing up, I was alone a lot. Uh, my parents worked a lot. Um, and as it were, where they took me to live, there weren't very many children there. In fact, my only friend was Andy, Andy Ojode. Um, so it was, I learned to, number one, grow up very fast if I wanted to keep up with the rest. And number two, just to be independent. That was uh, how my upbringing was. That's what I learned very, very early. For majority of us, we've known your father and your granddad in the political arena. Uh, but I'm sure you have very many childhood memories of, uh, you know, how you grew up with your dad around. Maybe tell me a little bit about that. You know, like, like those special moments you'd have with him, uh, some of the things you'd do that are uniquely yeah. him as a father. You know, it's funny. When I was growing up, people used to ask me, um, how does it feel to have Raila Dinga as your father? And you know, at that time, I used to be like, it's normal, you know? I didn't realize who Raila Dinga was. I didn't realize what a father is meant to do or how they're meant to act. For you, it was a father first, then... Yeah. Yes. And when I grew older is when I realized there was absolutely nothing normal about that situation. But I think it was the first time when we were running for the... He was running for president in 97, and he took me on the campaign trail. In 97, I was seven. I was about seven or six. And uh, that time it was NDP, Tinga, you know, the tractor. And we went to Woodley, and he put me on top of this tractor that drove right into Kibera. So here I was, six years old, and I just remember seeing the crowds coming towards the car and, and being afraid. But not really afraid because they were, they were smiling, you know. They they were cheering, they were staring. And then at that point, I think is when I realized um, who Raila Odinga is, that he's not just like every other father. Um, but I like that he exposed us to those situations earlier, you know. And now it, it, we're so excited to go for rallies. So I believe that was something that was extremely unique. <clears throat> and he'd also call us up to speak at these rallies, which was frightening at the time, but now I'm very happy because now we can speak in public. But are there some childhood memories you remember? Like, did he used to take you out swimming? You know, did he used to cook for you? Just some of those things that fathers do that uh, we may not see in the public uh, light. He used to, his big thing was traveling. Um, he was very insistent on us traveling, especially traveling alone. But I think, oh, he used to take us out, he used to take me out, as I told you, I was much younger, on Sunday to go swimming at uh, Lillian Towers. And so we'd go, and while I was swimming, he'd be in the gym. He's always been a, a gym rat. And uh, that was something that we used to do. It became special, like, every other Sunday or one Sunday a month. I'd get to hang out with my dad for, for a change. So it was, it was really special then. Tell me a little bit about your mom. Because your dad, of course, has been in the limelight for a long time. Uh, but your mom is also a little bit, once in a while we see her, but we don't get to hear much from her. Yeah, she's, she's quiet. She works in the background. But I think more so my mother is 
a bigger influence on me. Um, growing up, obviously, I was with her a lot more. Um, but just the woman that she is, you know, she, she's always been a proponent of, of strong women. And early on, she exposed me to very many strong women, you know. I was named Winnie after Winnie Mandela. And I remember my mother gave me Winnie Mandela's autobiography, My Story, when I was about 11 years old. And when I read it, it, it changed my life, you know, because I, I could see who I was named after. I could connect with her. And it sort of exposed me to this realm of strong women who may not necessarily be given a platform to discuss what they've done. And so I started reading about the likes of Indra Gandhi, uh, Benazir Bhutto, Benazir Bhutto, who was also influenced me a lot because of there were similarities in her father was also the prime minister at some point. So I think seeing my mother do that and getting out there really exposed me to a lot. Um, and she really influenced me to be, to be the woman that I am today. And uh, you mentioned that uh, you're the fourth born and you pretty much grew up alone because your siblings were not around. Tell me about them. Where were they? Well, they were all in college. Um, Junior is the closest in age to me, Ryla and he's, he's 11 years older than me. So probably when I was in kindergarten, he was in high school. Um, the same with Rosemary, it's 13 years, and with Fidel, it was 17 years. So they were always in college, but they'd write, um, they would call. Uh, I didn't see them as much, but I would go visit them as well. You know, the, actually the first time I actually remember seeing Fidel, I was 11 years old. Um, my father sent me to America all on my own, you know? He used to do crazy things like that. Yeah. So he put me on an airplane. And so I went to stay with my sister Rosemary. And Fidel lived in DC at that time. And I remember walking into his apartment, and he wasn't home. But Fidel being Fidel, his house was full of people, all his friends who had come over. And then he walked in maybe an hour later. And we were so awkward, we didn't know how to be with each other because, you know, I'm a little kid and he's a grown man, but, um, you know, we're meant to be siblings. Uh, and from then on, it was, we, after that, after we got over the awkwardness, we just meshed, you know, he became that, you know, even a father figure in some sense to me. Um, we were extremely close. Okay. Uh, before we concentrate on Fidel, because I've read some articles of how he's influenced you and that you looked up to him, uh, I guess just like you've described after the awkwardness. Uh, tell me about, you know, the other siblings. Did you ever get a time to bond and, you know, yes. get together? Well, with Rosemary, my only sister, obviously, she, she taught me a lot. In fact, I see her every day now. Um, we're very close. Um, Junior influenced me a lot in terms of sports. As you know, I was a very big sports player. I played on the Kenya national team when I was younger. Junior introduced me to basketball. What, what particular game did you Basketball. Do? Okay. Um, introduced me to basketball, to video games. He actually made me sort of a tomboy. Mm -hmm. um, and music, rap music. <laughs> yeah. um, those, I had different relationships with everybody. I still do. But we're all very, very, very close. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you grew specifically close to Fidel uh, before he passed away. Uh, is this simply because you are living in the States with him? Well, I didn't, I didn't live in the States with him. By the time I went to the States, Fidel was back here. Um, I, I, I can't say why. We just got each other. We just understood each other. You know? um, him being the oldest, myself being the youngest, and Rosemary and Ryla are very close in age. So those two got along. Um, I don't know why, we just always ended up being together and started building our relationship from you know, when I was 11 and we never fought. <laughs> I think that was it. We never fought because he was always too old to fight with me, you know? What are some of the special moments that you remember with Fidel? Um, God, there are many. Traveling, we used to laugh a lot. We used to, we usually used to go for, um, like if it's a meeting with my dad or something like that. And to be Fidel and I, and we just, you know, like make fun of the situation or sort of add a light touch to what was going on. We used to laugh a lot. That was our thing, like, I, I can't really explain it, but you know. Yeah. He seemed to have been a very easy guy, you know, to get along with. He had many friends around him. Uh, did that influence you in any way to who you are today? Definitely. 
um, she was very respectful of everybody, you know? Um, and it was very important for him to, to not forget where he was from. Or, 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 and he was very proud of being an Odinga. You know, I, I myself am proud of being an Odinga, but you, you know, sometimes that creates ideas in people's heads of who you are. And so most um, often I go by Kazi. All of my friends call me Kazi. Um, so I didn't really like approaching people as Winnie Odinga because I didn't want to be judged from that. It almost creates a stereotype. Yeah, exactly. And so Fidel will always say, don't be ashamed to be an Odinga. Don't be afraid to be an Odinga. Yeah, you know, like, you know how far the Odingas have come. So um, that, but in his way of expressing that, but still being extremely humble. And he had time, which is, you know, I have to work on my patience. But Fidel had this enormous patience for everybody. And that was something I, I think I'll take away from him. I learned how to be respectful of everybody that I meet. Uh, moving on now and coming back to you, uh, what did you study when you went to the States? When I was in the States, I did a double major. I studied uh, communication, and I also studied international business and economics. So I got two degrees in one. Currently, I am doing my MBA at USIU. And uh, next year, I plan to go to South Africa to get a master's in African development. Um, so those are all the things that I did. Having done all that, and uh, do you have any political ambitions? Uh, no. You know, when you're a child of a politician, it, it kind of goes two ways, you know? You either love politics or you hate politics. But one thing you can't deny is that you're a little bit of a politician inside. So right now, I'm just focusing on you know, my business and my school. But the same with politics. I've always been of the opinion that it's not something you decide. You know, you, I don't really support those career politicians. It's something, it's the people who choose you. If there's a calling, if there's a, a gap in society, then that's where the best politicians are made out of, not like, why not? I'm trying to make some money, and I join in, you know? Let me try it as a job. No, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be a job. Well, maybe coming back to you and uh, your relationship, uh, are, are you seeing anyone married and gay? <sighs> well, my father's going to watch this. <laughs> 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 uh, n I'm OK. Is that <laughs> give me the political answer? Yes, that's a political <laughs> answer. We need to know whether there is actually somebody in the scene um, or okay. you're Single and free to mingle, as they say. Uh, yes, but not mingling. I'm, oh, okay. I'm staying focused right now. <laughs> what are your dreams and aspirations in the future? What do you, where do you see yourself in the future? I, I want to make an impact. You know, A few weeks ago, we began this foundation, the Girl Touch Foundation, that really focuses on getting these, the youth out there, you know, and just telling the youth that you must be part of constructing your own reality, your own framework. You, you can't rely on people to give you things. You can't rely on the government. You can't wait. You can't wallow. You know, we have this society that's wallowing in this miasma of, of idleness. You know? So we want, so I'm going county to county, school to school, to get these kids talking, getting them proactive, not waiting for opportunities, seeking, starting businesses. You know, very, Often you hear that you must go to school, start your business, na 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 etc. There's a plan you must follow. But I want to introduce the aspect of duality, that just because you're young doesn't mean you can't do, start a business. I started my photography company two years ago when I was in university, and now I've taken photos all over the world. I didn't know anything about taking photos, but I, that was self-taught. So I want to introduce the aspect of you self-empowerment, not waiting for this handout. Um, so if I can influence that even just a little bit, or inspire somebody to do that just a little bit, I think that uh, that'd be a great achievement for me. How do you go about doing that? Because one might look at you and think that you're probably saying that having grown up in a very good background with many advantages, which you cannot ignore by virtue of the fact that you're an Odinga. Uh, so one might look and say, well, I'm from a background that's not as privileged as yours. How are you getting that message across um, by getting yourself out maybe of the Odinga, uh, what did I call it, stereotype? Yeah, but see, the Odinga name, like you say, is not always a blessing. 
sometimes it's a curse. And I've also faced my challenges because of being an Odinga. But the approach that we're taking to this is positive peer pressure. You see, the people that I am talking to, I'm of the same age group, right? 18 to 35, I fit right in there. And the approach we're trying to take is not a top-down approach, which is not your, your, your father telling you to do this, your mother telling you, your principal telling you to do this, but your, your peer, your friend. And that, I think the message is what's important, regardless of what background you come from. Because I know people who have come from very good backgrounds and still are non-starters, cannot get out there. The message that we're selling is self-empowerment. And I think that works very efficiently if it's coming from somebody who has been in their shoes. You know, a young kid who's confused about what's going to happen in their future, not knowing what they want to do with their lives. Those are problems kids face all this time. And I think that's a a positive way for us to uh, ensure that. Because if you encourage them, then we get things like innovation. And PESA began here. You, know? you must encourage them to explore the arts. You can't, you know, we have a society of hundreds and thousands of doctors, but there are no hospitals. Right? And some of those doctors could be artists. You, know, you have artists coming out and doing amazing work, or people not even realizing how good their work is, because they've not been given that chance or that platform or the idea that you can actually make a living out of being an artist. So truly what I'm trying to sell is self-empowerment. Do you ever get uh, a time where you find it difficult to disassociate yourself, especially when you're trying to drive a certain agenda from your family, as in you are just winning, as opposed to winning? That's when I use Kazi. <laughs> Is Kazi your name or a nickname? It's, it's, it might as well be my name, but it's a nickname I've had since I was like five years old. Um, and I really had that, and I think every child sort of goes through that, that phase where they're trying to discover themselves. And I think I had that time when I was in university. Um, and that's why I went so far away. Uh, because I did, at that time my father was a prime minister. And I wanted to learn how it is, you know, in the real world. Because you know, you're sheltered here. And you were sort of handed some things here. So I went out there as Kazi, and I formed my name as Kazi. And um, I think when I'm trying to escape a little bit is when okay. I go by. You go to Kazi. What, what, what does the name mean? Is it Kazi as we do it in Swahili? Yes. When I was a kid, I was one of those kids that couldn't sit down. You know, always working, 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 cleaning the house, washing the clothes, cooking, whatever it was. And so I think that workaholic comes from my father a bit. Um, and so my sister said, you're, you're going to be Kazi. What qualities do you think you've taken from your mom? You mentioned that the hard work uh, you know, is from your dad. What have you got from your mom? My mom is that pride of being a woman, <laughs> that strength. She always used to buy me these t-shirts when I was small, like anything a man can do, a woman can do better, you know? Um, and I think subconsciously, I kept getting those messages subliminally from her. Um, the independence, she used to drive, you know, she'd drive us to Bondo, you know, those days with a stick Holland shift, Island. yeah, or uh, crazy things and cook and do all those things, but it, she was doing quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And so from her, I just learned self-determination, um, that there's absolutely nothing that can stop me, um, especially my background. I should never let that stop me or hold me back. Um, from doing what you have to do? Doing what I, what I was meant to do. Okay. You know, what I'm on this earth to do. You mentioned that there are some disadvantages, the advantages of course, and disadvantages of being an Odinga. What are some of those disadvantages? There are a few. Um, like your bill is never the correct amount, <laughs> you know? What do you mean? <laughs> like your bill is always a few thousand bob higher. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But there's just um, certain, I don't like people making a fuss around me. I don't, I prefer things a little bit simple. Um, and there's certain fusses that come about, uh, I don't want to get so into this, but there's certain fusses that come about when people hear you so and so. There's certain places you, 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 you might want to go but can't go um, because of what the reaction would be. Um, you know, there's certain, in a way, especially more and more when you're the prime minister, there's, you can't really live your life. It's always with the thought of, you know. You have to think about the repercussions. Exactly. I mean, it, it makes you responsible. But when you're a kid, you know.
<laughs> you want to be a kid? Yeah, you want to be a kid. Are there certain things that maybe you did and you had to kind of like, you know, do them incognito because, of course, you were fearing the reaction or not fearing, uh, but you're concerned that it might have a negative effect? I'm going to give you the political answer, which is no. The very straightforward child always did what I was meant to do. <laughs> which, of course, we know is not true. Rich, I don't know what you've heard, but <laughs> I always do things the right way. The correct way. Okay. okay. Now, you're one who has a very strong opinion, even in terms of politics. And I remember there's a tweet uh, specifically when uh, there was the ODM um, um, elections and, the, you know, they all went bad with the fam infamous men in black. And there was a tweet that you'd put um, online. Tell me about that. I mean, that day I was just tweeting my opinion. Um, but sometimes you, people don't realize you're your you're own person. You're an individual, and they sort of start to believe that whatever you say must be the opinion of Rilo Dingo or Ida Dingo or Rosemary or Dingo, you know? Um, so those are some of the disadvantages that we have. But I mean, I have my own political thoughts. I have my own ideas, and that was just an example of me uh, expressing myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have to be more careful. Did that stop you from expressing yourself thereafter? Because I'm sure you got enough response based on the fact that it sounded like you were sort of uh, not too happy with the way the elections were held, despite the fact that it's your dad who was um, at the helm. Yeah, you know, we sort of live in a society that is um, very prone, I can say, to inefficiency, to things not working. And I think it's important that people can be critical of themselves and the processes that they've done. Yes, ODM is my father's party. Yes, I belong to that party and I support it. But if things are not going how I want it, I think it's good to reflect and say, hey, we didn't do that thing correctly. This is how we should be doing A, B, C, and D. Um, so I think, I think that's a very important thing to achieve. Do you think or do you feel like so far the party has run well? It has its challenges. You know, being the biggest party, you know, it's very hard to uh, please everybody. Uh, I think they're doing the best they can. They have jabs here, they get jabs here and there in the media. Um, in terms, personally, as a member of ODM, I'm very satisfied <laughs> with my party uh, and the work they're doing, especially the governors and the work they're doing. So I, I, I'll, give them, I'll give them a good grade on that. Okay, would you envis envision yourself as uh, joining the party at a leadership level, as opposed to just being a member? If, if the situation sees fit, if I'm required, but you know, and by that I mean by the people, if, uh, if there's something that I see that's not being done and I feel that I'm the right person to remedy that, then, you know, why not? Anybody can. That's the goodness of the great thing about ODM. It's a place for everybody. Um, so absolutely. Let's talk about maybe like the elections, because uh, we know the side of the story where we've seen, you know, what's happening. Uh, but what goes on in your mind while you're at home? Uh, maybe talk about the pressure and just waiting, you know, with bated breath for the results, because this has happened uh, several times for your father, for example. I always liken them to like a death. It feels like a death in the family. Um, After the announcement or yeah. during? During, you know, we, we have this thing, you know, and I call it sometimes a disease, you know, hope. That keeps you going. It keeps you going, but it's a very terrible thing to rely on. Because sometimes, you know, it doesn't exist. It's just a figment of your imagination. Um, but after, it's... <sighs> But how can hope be a figment of your imagination? It's, you've, you've done the work, you're expecting. You've done the uh, work, yes, but there's some people who are doing some other work to make sure that you know, your work doesn't go through. And so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not easy, but it's not the end of the world. You know? um, and you also have to realize, what is your goal with the election? Right? The goal has never been for Rilo Dinger to enter State House, but it's the societal change or what or, or Raila Dinga being in State House means for society, you know, that everybody has a chance to get into uh, that house, you know, that you don't have to be, be certain, a certain person or do certain things for you to get in there. 
And so even though you know, the announcement is made and it hasn't gone as we wanted, that's not your end goal. You know? And we still have many years ahead of us. And so you know, we can keep looking forward. We learn from our mistakes. And every time we regroup, and try again. You liken it to a death. And uh, death naturally has a process that you have to go through for you to recover. Um, how does one get through that and how have you as a family got through that uh, to a point where it actually gives you hope, although you say it is an figment of an imagination, but that hope is what probably gives you as a family the ability to imagine that, look, we can still uh, make change, a positive change in this country. Yeah, you're right. Um, I don't know how we What's get through process? it. It's never a, a, def, a definitive process. Well, I don't know, time? <laughs> I'm going to say time. Um, but we, we, we become very close. We're already close, but uh, become much closer. Um, because like everybody else, at the end, we only have each other. So we become very close. Uh, you thought we were private, we were even more private <laughs> at that point. And just continue getting into a schedule. Many of us, not myself, but my siblings have children, you know, making sure that that doesn't affect them, getting them back in the schedule, going back to work, and just gradually moving on. So life sort of goes back to normalcy over a period of time. Um, and do you ever sit down like a family and sort of discuss the wins and losses? Yeah, we do. We do. Again, we're. we're very self-critical. We're critical of ourselves and um, we try and see. You know, sometimes, even though you're critical, sometimes you've tried your best. It's, it's, there's just nothing more you could have done. Um, but we sit, we talk, we laugh, and you know, we move on. When you're seated maybe like at the dining room table and uh, as a family, one would imagine that uh, maybe the larger part of the discussion would be political. Is that the case? And if not, what do you discuss? No, we're very, um, depends who's on the table. If dad's there, then we're probably gonna, t everybody has something they want from dad, right? So everybody has a list in their mind and we all just go pa, 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 pa. Uh, it's business, whether it's football, whether it's a trip, whatever you'd want. Um, or maybe even just, he made a political move and we want to know why or, um, what's the plan, but you know, you know, nobody ever knows a Rilo Dinga is thinking, even us, <laughs> we never know. No, we never know, uh, but we try and get those out of him. So it's just general stuff. Uh, I'm going to school, I need to do this, you're going this, you know, just general things. He has certainly lived a very busy life uh, given uh, the political position that he has had all through, uh, prime minister, uh, leader of opposition, and even before that. Um, would you, are there moments that you wished he was there and he wasn't? One thing I've realized is that this lifestyle, you have to commit to it. And sometimes that means, um, you know, reducing certain times that you would have for your family or your business or whatever. Um, but I'm a, I think I'm just like him. I think I see the bigger goal, right? And I think we all have to make sacrifices, even him. So I don't think there was a time where I was like, he should have been here. No. Maybe small instances when I was younger, but as I grew older, um, I understood. There was a time he was in prison and, uh, you know, for a period of time. Do you remember that or were you too young? No, I was too young. You were too young to remember that. Okay, because I wanted to know what the family was going through and what they, you felt about it. I was too young. You were too young. <laughs> do, you, do you talk about it now? Yes. Does he ever talk about his political journey? Yes, he does. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I know it. And so I assumed everybody knows it, but I realized the story is not out there as much. Um, Especially when I was growing up, he told me a lot. And so I understood the political journey, I knew it. Um, but you see, like I always say sometimes, is that my siblings and myself grew up in two different households. You know? When they were growing up, Raila Odinga was an enemy of the state. When I was growing up, um, he was an up-and-coming opposition politician and all those things, and eventually a prime minister. So, you know, there's a, in our houses, like, two different mentalities, um, two different approaches to life. But I think that's good, there's, two, there's a balance.
Yes. The history that you say that uh, you know, but maybe many people do not. What parts maybe don't people know about his political journey? Um, like, uh, you know, the escape when he went to Norway, um, what it's really like in detention, uh, in, in Yaya House torture chambers, what it's really like. Uh, I've heard from my siblings when my mother was arrested and thrown into jail, what that was like when she lost her job because of who she was when they would kick my siblings out of school. Um, there are very many stories that people don't hear. Um, so, I, I, th I mean, those are stories I think should get out. And uh, these are stories that he has told you. Yeah, what has he told you about them? Because maybe the face that many of us see is a very brave man who, despite going to prison, he'll still push his agenda. But maybe there are moments where he felt that uh, maybe it's time for me to quit, and maybe he has shared that with you. What's the story that he has shared with you? Uh, in terms of that, she's not shared that with me. Um, in terms of that, I really have no comment on it, because he's not shared that with me. Mm -hmm. No, but like the torture chambers and all that, has, has he sat down and maybe talked to the family about it? Or even just as you talk, he talks about his journey? Yes, he has. Well, um, he has, for example, being in a torture chamber and it's uh, water to your, to your waist. And so you can't sit down because, you know, you'll drown, obviously. And it's a big whole room and there's one light right at the top and you're there for days and you're not eating, you know. Uh, or they call you out to interrogate you and somebody has a big plate of nyamachoma and you haven't eaten for days and he's taunting you to, you know, give up your beliefs or what you know for this meal. Um, and Raila Dinga being Raila Dinga, we all know, never gave up his beliefs for a nyamachoma. Right. So he's told me all those stories. How does that make you feel? Um, in terms of looking at now the regime that would take your father, because we're not now just talking about a political leader, but this is your father, and I'm sure our view as a country may be uh, him as a leader. You go through a lot, uh, but now this is your father you're talking about. I think all of them, knowing what he's been through, and you, you want to protect him. Uh, but two, one thing I think he's taught all of us is. Uh, forgiveness. He's got this amazing ability to, to forgive those who have done him wrong or look past it. Um, so if he's the one who's been done wrong and he's not over it, who are we to still hold on to that anger? And he's not over it, rather. So um, I think with that, you know, and also it's good, it's therapeutic. When you don't hold on to pain and anger, or all these emotions, it's therapeutic to move on and find a way forward. So would you say you've learned that ability to forgive and uh, move on in life despite people trying to pull you back from him? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. How does that influence your life today? How does it affect your day-to-day -day living? I get up. <laughs> yeah. I get up and try new things. You know, this has to be one of the hardest years of my life, losing my brother. Um, but you get up and just keep going every day. You know, Remember, like I keep saying, there's the end goal. There's something everybody wants to achieve. And just keeping that in sight is, is a good way to move forward. Where do you see yourself in uh, you know, the future, in many years to come? What's your ambition? Where do you want to be? You know, I'm in energy right now. So if I could be further up the chain in energy, absolutely. Um, I don't know, you know? Are you in energy by choice or inheritance? Is it maybe a business that you've inherited? And, uh, no, it's a business I began. Um, it's by choice, definitely. It's a business I began. I want more people using renewable energy. Um, instead of us cutting down trees, uh, getting clean energy, water, solar, biogas, whatever it is. And so I saw the need for it, and I'm really trying to push it now. Okay. What, what brought you into energy? What gave you that idea? Especially given that uh, you studied something, okay, you've studied business, but energy is a very specific uh, area. I feel like energy is one of the pillars that we need to move as a society. It, it runs everything. And once you get the energy right, especially if, you know, if people have powers in their, power in their homes, then you, you, you can now begin, it's a platform to begin worrying about other things, other infrastructures. Because 
I mean, we see so many inefficiencies in the system, you know, be it po frequent power cuts, be it um, traffic, you know, or uh, going into a mall and your car is searched, you know, boarding a matatu and you're, you're searched, things like that. There's so many inefficiencies in the system. And so I think we have to correct this inefficiency. And I believe one way is by educating people. Right? And there are many mediums you can educate people. Television, computers, radio, whatever. But for you to reach the people, they need the energy. And so it, it's like a long thought process. Um, but I think everything leads back to it. Okay. okay, you've talked about inefficiencies. And of course, as a country, we have various and many and numerous challenges, especially in terms of our leadership. Um, but first, maybe just to get your opinion, what do you think of our um, leadership currently, politically speaking? And this is across the board. I think there's too much politics. There's too much politics. You know? There's too many games. And I think there are too many egos that are dying to be satisfied instead of people actually working. You know? Like I said, there's inefficiencies in the system, right? But you're not even given the chance to try and alter these things. You know? Corruption cases come up. People are making noise here. Social media is going off. When really we're focusing on all the wrong things instead of, of actually helping the system, but not to completely blame the political class. I feel as citizenry, we're not doing enough. You know, I was with my German friends a few weeks ago, and he said, if you want the system to work, you have to be a part of it. So if you want the system to work, we can't always be criticizing it, but be a part of it. You know, if the traffic light is red, don't drive. You know? It means, means stop. You know, just small things like that. Um, so I, I feel like those are the, the issues that we have, that we must overcome. Um, there's too much division, and there's too much uh, immature play, instead of actually getting down to work uh, and, and doing things and sorting things out. One might argue that you're in a very good position um, to make a very positive change and use uh, what you know and what you have to make, you know, a positive change in this country. Um, what would you say to that? It's possible. Um, if I can, I will. Um, I don't... It's possible. If I can, I definitely will. Um, but I also feel that everything has its time. You know, you don't climb a tree from the top. Everything has its time and its place. Um, and I'm still learning. Given an opportunity, you would actually use the position that you have to make a change? If I could, absolutely. It would be selfish of me not to. If I could make a positive change that could help my country, absolutely. Do you consider yourself patriotic? Yes. Jingoistic sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means. What does that mean? Extremely <laughs> patriotic. What are some of the uh, attributes and things that you'd say uh, define you as a patriotic Kenyan? Um, that's a very good question. I, I don't think it's uh, this patriotism is a public display. I feel that like it's a personal uh, feeling, you know, what you feel for your country. And you know, sometimes people, this politics clouds the mind and people say, I, I don't want to be Kenyan, mm -hmm. the system doesn't work, etc. Uh, but forget about that and think of Kenya as itself, you know, our animals, our tourism, our rainforest, our savannas, etc., etc. Those things that people fly miles to come and see, pay thousands of dollars to come and see, those are ours. And so we must claim ownership of these things, all right? Um, and that's, those are things that I feel for this country. Um, ownership and pride in, in what we have and our diversity, you know, 42 different tribes numerous languages. Where else do you get that? I think that's an incredible thing to have. And we sometimes forget that we have these good things and can't focus on the bad. But if we focused on these good things, yeah, our tourism industry is dying, and instead we're making noise about this, let's focus on this. Elephants are being killed, and one person is fighting for them. Let's all fight for these things. You know, We have to have accountability and responsibility. We we'll always say, Oh, the government is going to do it. Oh, the government is not doing it. Then you do it. You know? Why do you have to wait? And just say, I'm not elected. You don't have to be elected to make a change. You know, just be a good citizen.
can still do something from wherever you are. Okay. Now, the current political leaders we have, uh, and more specifically, uh, maybe the age of your father, um, are an older generation, obviously, and generation um, uh, fr from you, but maybe even two generations uh, apart. Uh, what would you advise in terms of changing the political landscape in terms of the age group that we have? Because obviously uh, ideas have changed, ideologies have changed over time, and if we maintain uh, the, the older generation, not that we'll do away with them completely, uh, but there is a risk of not having anything new coming up. I think whether old or new, it's, uh, we need a whole transformation of a mindset. Because you can still have young people, and their, their ideas are no better than the old people. You can still have young, corrupt people. You know? um, I think it's a complete overhaul of the mindset. And sometimes that will take the experience of the older. But uh, the energy and the innovation of the younger, I think it's a collaboration of two. Um, to get com you know, take all the older politicians and put them in a nursing home is not the answer but rather a collaboration. Because we have seen how sometimes the younger politicians are a bit reckless in their ways, in their mouths. Um, I think bringing these two together and learning from each other is what is needed, especially learning from each other, learning from the younger, the older and learning from the younger generation about what's new, how we need to do things more efficiently, right? But there's certain things, for example, and I don't mean to digress here, uh, like devolution, right? Instead of people coming all the way to Nairobi, we have this high rate of rural to urban migration. You know? Take these centers of operation to the people and so that they can access services down there. Right? Now, very many young people don't realize the benefit of devolution to them. But those that are older, those that have constructed this reality of ours, uh, should be able to explain this to them, that this is why certain things are happening. And so I think you need the experience of, uh, of, of both, of everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, you, seem, you have quite a number of ideas of how you know, change can be brought about in the country, and you have an ear with your father, for example. Is this a conversation you'd sit down and have with him? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Do you? Yes, I do. I do. I think um, part of the advantage of being so young and being the youngest is I'm, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm a bit reckless with my mouth, but I don't hold back. I kind of just tell him what I'm thinking uh, or what I think should be happening, um, I think I have that reputation in the family as being that one. Do you think you got that from him? Perhaps. Would, would you say he's um, reckless in the way he talks? No. I think he, he talks from the heart. I think he's very uh, soulful and emotional when he speaks. He, you, know, you can see it in his eyes. He's as upset as I am about inefficiencies. And so when he speaks, he won't sugarcoat it, he won't lie to you. He'll tell you, and sometimes that hurts to hear the truth. Well, they say the truth hurts. It, it does. <laughs> okay, one of the things that we know about him is that he's uh, very, um, he has a charm. He has a way of communicating using various stories and, you know, just a humorous way, let me put it that way. And Vitenda Willis, is he the same at home? <laughs> he tries, but we stop him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's a regular dad, so you probably, like that uh, Kitenda Willie you're hearing at a rally, I've probably heard it 50 times. You know, I can recite it verbatim as he's saying the speech. You can repeat it after Yeah, you. so um, he's, he's like that, he's, but he's not so much like that. Um, with him, he's always, I think he's always, he's always giving us secret challenges that you don't realize is a challenge until after it's done. Trying to teach us things, but never directly, you know? He'll always throw you here and there. Give me an example of some of those uh, you know, challenges that he'll throw that are not direct. Like some of the people he, he'll introduce you to. You know? He'll tell you, you have to do this, meet this person, he's going to do this and this and this and this. And you go meet the person, but the person has absolutely no interest in that field, has no experience in that field. Um, you end up finding that it was a waste of time, but really what he's trying to do is expose you to uh, different characters out there, you know? Um, it's always something like that, or I, I can't really think off the top of my head, but it's always some form of 
lesson behind everything. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your mom, Aida Odinga, and uh, maybe some of the influence she has had on your dad to where he is today. Uh, she's the backbone. My mom is the, like, I don't think we'd function without her. Um, sometimes, well, the, the roles switch depending on the situation, but somebody's the voice of reason, the calm one, and uh, she, she's strong. And I think of all the things Raila Odinga goes through, I think the person who gets the brunt uh, is Aida, mom, really, because she can, she's seen it all through, and her life has been affected because of it, and her children's lives have been affected because of it. Um, so she's really the, the pillar of our family. What are some of the lessons you've learned from her that have kept you going and kept him going? Um, she's very prayerful. Um, and spiritual, uh, but uh, not in a you must go to church type of way, but finding inner peace, you know, with your religion or with your God or whatever it is, finding inner peace and using that inner peace to not let anything knock you off your equilibrium. Yeah, don't let day-to-day -day stresses, don't let somebody put you in a bad mood. Um, I think she's taught us all that. And uh, going back to Fidel, did he ever have political ambition, do you think? Yes, he did. Um, I believe so. We used to share a lot. Um, he did. And uh, I mean, it's unfortunate. Um, but that's it. You, you wouldn't want to follow up maybe on some of his dreams? They, you know, just like you said, they were his dreams. <laughs> Not necessarily my dreams, um, but definitely honor him in any way that I possibly can, honor his memory, um, do things to make him proud. Because out of everybody, well, my sister as well, they, they really pushed me uh, to, be, to be the woman that I am today, to express myself. Like I told you, as a writer, I'm a photographer. Every one of my, like, that's my photography book. Um, oh, you have a book as well. To show my talents to the world. And so I think one way would be to ex expose myself just a little bit more. Um, I think that would make him proud. Tell me something that maybe we don't know about Winnie. There's a lot. <laughs> we can take just a few. Uh, Some of those that are not known to the public, I'm sure there are those things that uh, uh, we just don't know about Winnie. I'm a photographer. Uh, I can't. What? Oh, you're a poet? Yeah. Okay. I write my poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, spoken word, really. Um, and do you writers. perform? I used to. I haven't really found the venues. Mm -hmm. um, but if there are some, I hope somebody would invite me, because I've been looking. Maybe you can just do a bit of spoken word. No, no, no. <laughs> That's for another four. No, come on, Winnie. You, you can do this. It's just putting you on the spot, but I'm sure you can do a little bit, whether it's on the political arena, whether it's... I don't have anything off the top of my head right now. No? Because I thought spoken word is one that is literally just done as you go along. Yeah, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I want to I wanna make sure my message is heard. And it's clear. Okay. What else don't we know about Winnie? And her ambitions and her plans and... I don't know, you know, this works better when it's question and answer. Um, okay, what makes, what, what are the things that make you get annoyed about maybe our country? What are the things you love about the country? I know you've, you've mentioned our wildlife and, uh, you know, uh, patriotism and all that, but maybe what are some of the things that really annoy you about Kenya that you would want change? I, like I told you, again, sorry to take it back, but basically the, we're inefficient. I've lived in the numerous cities where the system works, right? And to come here and to be stuck in traffic, you know? And to go to Nakomat and to be searched, you know? It, it, the, the concept is completely foreign to me. And the fact that we have accepted it, you know? We sort of accept everything we're given, you know? And that's not right. When, when, a, when a sick person is walking to a hospital and they're searched, Right? But a GK can just drive through. You know, what does that tell you? That tells you that in the government's eyes, every citizen is a potential terror suspect. You know? And that's not shouldn't be the case. 
America with all its terror threats and its 300 million people, they don't do that. That's because the problem is contained at the mouth, at the door, on the border. So why is it that we have to deal with this thing now? I mean, you go to Nakumach and you have to pay for parking. You know? That's the institution passing the burden of parking on to you. Why, why is that? It's the only country that does that. And we'll just sort of take things as they're normal, but they're not, they're not normal. They shouldn't be accepted. You know, we shouldn't live in a state of fear. Yesterday I went to the movies, and for the first 30 minutes, I was looking at every exit and trying to figure out if anything happened to me here, what should I do? Where would I go? What am I? That shouldn't be. You shouldn't live in a state of fear like that and say everything is fine, it's not fine. And I think those are things that... Um, Where are we going wrong? Why is that something that we have uh, become lethargic and accepted? I think it's years of this pressure, you know? Years of this, um, I mean, we're obsessed with politics. Yeah, the news is complete politics, you know? There's nothing else in the news. Everything is politics and everything is negative. You know when those, when the, sorry to say, when, when, you, when you guys were off, it was like a Relief. Yeah, because, you know, if you constantly have these mediums everywhere that are constantly telling you, this and bad thing happened, this corruption case, this murder, this car accident, what, what, what. It must take, on some level, uh, an, an effect on, on the person, on the being. And so I think we've become so used to hearing bad things that we expect bad things, that we don't even know what good things are anymore. You know? your, your road has two potholes, you're like, wow, this, this is not a bad road. You know? Why? You know? Your road has, like the new Kalashua bypass I see has speed bumps. Why do you have speed bumps on a road like that? or on a highway, like just before junction there's a speed bump. Why is there a speed bump? You know? Why can't we just drive normally? Mm -hmm. you know? So things just keep happening and we're just like, yeah, okay. So would you blame it on the media? Has the media given such a negative uh, perspective to a point where Kenyans have lost hope and accepted fate? I don't want to blame it fully on you because I don't want you to like, switch the story on me and tomorrow <laughs> I'm the target. Um, but definitely. I think sometimes they can be slightly irresponsible with how they report news. Um, they, uh, you know, stir emotions. Um, and I think they really have to start focusing on other things. You know? We can't be this obsessed. You know, it be, it's normal to me to see Rilo Ding in a newspaper. You know, in fact, there are times I used to read the newspaper just to find out where he was because his schedule was too busy. But it's abnormal for me not to see him then. Why? Why is he always in the newspaper? Well, why, why, are these, why is it always politics? Why are we not talking about um, these kids started a foundation the other day? Right? This swimming girl that did well. I mean, it's not real news. But just things like that. Why, why aren't we talking about those things? Positive things. I mean, we're 40 million Kenyans. Are you telling me there's absolutely, there are not even 100,000 that are doing good things every day that we can't write the stories about them? No? Well, one might argue and say that it's the politicians who want it that way and, you know, they're out to make sure that we receive and hear them. That's a good point that you're saying. That means that your media houses are compromised by these politicians. Because it doesn't matter what they want. If you're independent, you put what you want. Isn't it? Am I saying the truth? You are. So, I think that's where the problem comes back. Mm -hmm. And now, where does the change begin? Because surely it can't just be the media that's uh, to blame for where we are today, the apathy that we feel as Kenyans. You've just talked about traffic. I mean, you can sit in traffic today for three hours and tomorrow, business as usual. Nobody will say a thing. I think it's a complete overhaul. For example, traffic is a long conversation that we have to go into, and that just goes down to Nairobi City not having a single plan in its whole entire being. There should be a plan that would take maybe two, three years to develop. Once you do that, once you also de uh, develop devolution, right? and seize or at least slow the rate of this rural to urban migration, then you're able to develop centers with fewer people in it. If you can move people out to Kericho County, to Garissa County, to Mombasa County, whatever it is, right? And free up the space in Nairobi, then you can do it. You know, a few years ago, my father was doing the slum upgrading in Kibera, and it just got done a few months ago. When he was doing that, I mean, the re influx of people coming into immigration, into the slum, is hundreds of times larger than what you can build. So how are you meant to build and all these people are coming in? You, you can't fight it. 
So at first we have to stop that. If you stop these people coming and then we deal with the problem of traffic, uh, of overpopulation, that will help with distribution of power, you know, electricity, water services, garbage collection, um, all that, but we have to sort of slow down and disperse these funds around the country. If you were given an opportunity to speak to our political leaders, your dad included, what's the message you would give them? Just exactly what I've said. <laughs> Focus. Yeah? Focus. I feel like uh, a lot of the times, again, these egos need to be stroked. Forget that. F deal with your mandate, why you were chosen, and work. But if their egos are being stroked, it, it's you and I as a citizenship who are doing that. If, 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 you, if you feel like the leader you elected is not doing what you elected them for, don't vote for them. You know? If somebody gives you 2,000 bob for your ID card, don't, don't take it. Say you're going to vote. You know? Or 2,000 to go in there and tick, tick yes or no. Take the 2,000, but go in there and tick what you want to tick. Do you know what I'm saying? Don't be influenced by this money. We've created this society where it's money, 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 money. Everybody needs a handout. Everybody is demanding a handout. It shouldn't be like that. You should be able to, you know, be self-sufficient. Go in there and think for yourself and do what's right. Because at the end of the day, you're the one who's still staying where you're staying. You're the one who's having problems within your family. All right. Thank you very much, Winnie. I think it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, anything maybe you think we've not covered? I believe we've gotten everything. Everything. We've gone 360. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate your time.